What's going on everybody? Today we're talking about the Sony FX30 and I'm going to tell you my real life experience working with this thing on set, how I've rigged it out, how I've used it, and the results that I've gotten from it on numerous professional projects over the past roughly 10 months. So let's jump into it. If it's your first time here, my name is Kyle Harris. I've been a full-time freelance filmmaker for the past three years, and I primarily work in the sports and fitness space, working with companies like the NFL and the NCAA. And on this channel, I talk about all things filmmaking, so if that's your thing, make sure you hit that subscribe button. But today, we're gonna to talk about my real-world experience with the FX30. Just real quick, this is not gonna be an in-depth review on all the specific specs and features. There's plenty of those types of videos out there. This is just gonna talk about my actual use case, so I'm gonna show you guys a bunch of test footage from different shoots that I've been on with this, talk about how I've used it, how I've rigged it up, all those types of things. So if you're looking for the tech specs, not gonna find it here, but this is gonna be my honest feedback on this particular camera and how I've actually used it in the field. So I bought this back in late January, uh, switching over from Canon after switching to and from Sony and Blackmagic, and I've used a bunch of different cameras over the years, uh, but I ultimately wanted to go back to Sony just because of the specific ease of use when it comes to the video features and the fact that the industry has kind of moved more towards smaller camera rigs, more run and gun styles. So this is a really practical camera for the type of stuff that I've been doing. So I made that switch back over to Sony to ultimately get the best video features and ultimately the best performance out of the gear that I decide to bring on these shoots. So when it comes to the FX30, one of the biggest things is the value in terms of the actual output. The image quality on this camera is second to none in terms of its specific price point. For under $2,000, you're getting 14 and a half stops at dynamic range, you're getting S-Log3, and you're getting full sensor readout from a 6K oversampled image down to 4K, even in 4K60. So overall, the image quality that you get out of this camera is really high quality for something that's under $2,000. And it's something that you have to take into consideration when you're looking to buy any type of body. Now, one of the features that's really important to me when it comes to cameras is being able to rely on them in very extreme conditions. So I live in Florida and a lot of my shoots take place in Florida and that's all year round. So we can be talking middle of summer, taking these cameras out in 95 degree weather with 80% humidity and really needing to still rely on this camera to perform in those conditions. And that's one area where the FX30 really excels. As an example, in May, I was hired to go shoot a two-day event for USA Football, which was a flag football event. And I took this camera out and I was shooting all day long from 8 a.m. until about 4 p.m., shooting pretty much constant 4K 60s so that we had the option to slow it down in post. And I never once had an overheating issue with this. I had the monitor on it, I had the V-mount on it, I had it fully rigged up, and ultimately was able to shoot without even having to worry about it at all, all day long. And that's one thing, like I said, that's super important to me because when you're shooting sports, you've only got one opportunity to get that specific image because you're basically just documenting what's actually happening. So being able to rely on the camera that every time I hit record, it's not gonna cut, it's not gonna turn off without me realizing it, it's ultimately gonna capture that shot is super important to me and is super important to the clients that I ultimately work with. So knowing that I can rely on this camera even in the most extreme conditions is super important. And as you can see from all that test footage, the, the actual image quality that's coming out of this is super high quality. So you know that you can rely on it even in these harsh conditions. Some of this stuff was shot at high noon with that brutally hot sun. It was a relatively clear day. So you're getting absolutely no diffusion and no help from the light perspective. And ultimately this camera still provides a really nice crisp image that you can trust every single time that you're shooting with it. Now, besides the actual image quality that comes out of this camera, one of the things that's super important to me when it comes to choosing a camera is the ability to rig it out and how many other professional features it has so that you can operate it in a way that works best for your workflow. So when it comes to the stuff that I do, this camera has all the types of high-end cinema features that I need while still keeping that body relatively compact. 
So for me, most of the time when I'm going out to shoot this on a professional gig, I ultimately do rig it out pretty extensively. So I'll throw the cage on there from small rig. I'll put a base plate on there with a rod system that allows me to attach a V-mount battery to the back. I then uh, attach power supply through that V-mount battery to both my monitor and the camera. And I power the camera through the USB-C with power delivery. So when I do fully rig out this camera, it's no longer a small body. It's truly a, a very large and heavy rig, but it ultimately then has all the features on the body still that I need access to. So one of the sacrifices you typically make when you get a smaller body is the loss of some of these functions that are actually on the physical body, meaning record buttons, custom buttons, aperture dials, all those things that allow you to quickly access and change your settings are stuff that you typically lose when you go down to a smaller, more compact body. But what they've done really well with this and obviously the FX3 is maintaining so many of those custom buttons that we're used to and we ultimately need when we're talking about quickly switching settings in a cinema type of landscape. So for me, I've set up a lot of these buttons to be custom buttons based on the different types of settings that I need to change often. And ultimately I can control everything that I need to control without having to go into any of the quick menus when I'm just trying to adjust my basic exposure settings. So this is super convenient and allows me to access everything that I need super quickly. And on top of all the buttons that are on the outside of the camera, the actual functionality of the rest of the design of the camera is exactly what you would hope for. So having the full size HDMI is a no brainer. Where they put the rest of the ports is ultimately in a nice convenient spot so that you can rig everything out with the USB-C and then a, a mic jack. And then having that additional option to put on the XLR handle so that you can have professional audio quality coming out of this is what makes this camera something that you can absolutely rely on in professional settings. Now, all that being said, there is a reason that there's still an FX3 and there's an FX30. They do have different features and obviously it's not ever gonna be as good as the FX3, but the price point reflects that. So the sacrifices that you are making with this camera is obviously the fact that you've got the Super 35 sensor, which I don't actually see being an issue at all. There's actually a lot of things that I like about crop sensor cameras. And part of that is the fact that you can get a lot of different lens choices for it that are ultimately drastically cheaper than having to always get full frame glass. And they're usually smaller and lighter as well. So it does make it more convenient if you're in these run and gun styles, if you're shooting all day long, having a smaller kit and something that's even a little bit more inconspicuous in certain circumstances can actually make it a much better system. So for me, there's a lot that I actually like about the crop sensors. And as an example, the Sigma 18 to 50 is an unbelievable lens to go with this because it's got a 2.8 aperture. You're effectively getting a 28 to 75 on what would be a full frame camera. And that kit is super small, super lightweight, and you're still getting great image quality out of it. So if small and compact is something that's really valuable to you, that's something where having a crop sensor camera can actually be a significant benefit. That being said, you do sacrifice a little bit in terms of depth of field. And then where this camera and the FX3 really start to separate is when you're talking about 4K 120 and the low light performance. So obviously in this camera, 4K 120 is significantly cropped. And the reality of the 4K 120 in this camera is that it is still usable, but in very limited circumstances. So I'll throw up some footage that I have on here. Ultimately, what you're getting out of the 4K 120 is a true 4K image. So instead of it being downsampled from 6K like the rest of the frame rates in this camera, you're cropping into was effectively using the actual 4K portion of the sensor. So you do actually see more noise only because it's actually a little bit larger because it's not being downsampled back down to that 4K. So if you're shooting stuff that's more stationary and you're not actually moving the camera itself, you're gonna get pretty good performance out of this 4K 120 as long as you've got enough light. So while it's not perfect, having that option is great. And in a lot of circumstances, you don't really need 120 frames a second, 60 you can get away with a lot of stuff, which is why I went with this camera. I don't need 120 all that often. Granted, I do shoot a lot of sports, but I have a second body for that, which is the ZV-E1, which ultimately allows me to get some of that 120 with the full frame sensor. But in terms of a $2,000 body, and all the professional features that you get on this, 4K 120 is not a deal breaker, when it, in my mind at least, especially the way that I like to use it. And then really quickly, just to touch on the low light, I haven't really had any issues with it because you can still get up to 2500 ISO in S-Log3. 
you're not getting that full 12,800 and you already have the crop sensor so you get a little bit less light in there in general but 2500 ISO in most circumstances has been more than enough for me in my use case obviously if you shoot concerts or any other amount of things that 12,800 can really save your image but for most of the circumstances when I'm shooting sports when it's either lit by the outdoor lights or we're shooting during the day I don't really have issues with low light performance in this camera so that is definitely not a deterrent in my book when it comes to my specific use case but it's something that you may need to consider but overall i could not be happier with this camera i genuinely use it as my a camera even though i have the zve1 which has the fx3 sensor etc etc i find myself gravitating towards the fx30 more often than the zve1 for the overheating issues and all the other issues that that camera does have. I bought it for a very specific use case and it nails that use case. And I know that I have this to be my absolute workhorse in those super crazy conditions, hot days, stuff like that. I know I can rely on this camera where I know that I can't do that with the ZV-E1, but being able to pair them together to take advantage of the best of both worlds while paying virtually the exact same price as what I could have gotten a single FX3 for that provides me with a lot more value than just having one super expensive camera body that does it all. I now have these two and that gives me a lot more options. But all that being said, I could not recommend this camera more highly in terms of the work that I've done in particular. And if you find yourself doing similar work, I would definitely highly recommend checking this out. To me, it's the best budget cinema camera that's on the market and I don't see anything even remotely close. So I would definitely recommend picking this one up if you are in the market for it. But that's going to be all for me in this one, guys. Let me know in the comments down below what you think of the FX30. Is it good enough? Is it truly a cinema camera? Would you rely on it for your professional work? I'll be curious to see what you guys say down there, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.